Howard on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program Associate Professor Georgetown University, Qatar, uh, speaking to us from Qatar, Carl Weiderquist. Uh, Carl, welcome to the program. Thanks. Great to be here. So uh, there's a couple of things that I want to uh, talk to you. You've written extensively about um, uh, what you call the basic income guarantee. Some people call it a guaranteed annual income. There's there's multiple names, and I think uh, the, you know maybe you can parse that for us. I want to talk to you uh, about that, and also uh, work that you have done in um, in tearing apart these the the. The Dilemma of Libertarianism, uh, which I've, uh, I've read a lot of your work. I enjoy it and wanted to discuss it with you. But uh, I know this February, in fact, there is a meeting of the uh, 14th Annual North American Basic Income Guarantee Congress in New York. Uh, tell us, what is the basic income guarantee? Okay, well... <coughs> The basic income guarantee is the idea that income doesn't have to start at zero. That uh, we have uh, an incentive-based market system where you buy and you sell and you trade. The more that you sell of whatever you have, whether it's your labor or anything else, the more money you get. The way we have it set up is that if you don't any own anything that you can sell except for your labor, then your income starts at zero, which causes all kinds of problems, such as homelessness, poverty, suffering, and a desperation to take any job that's available, um, and uh, quite a few opportunities for, for uh, employers to take advantage of this. And so, well, the idea of a basic income guarantee is to have the income start at some higher level, hopefully enough to meet everybody's basic needs, so that you're, uh, you're not destitute, you're not without food, shelter, and clothing, you've got enough to buy this stuff. But otherwise, the market system can work just the same. You go out, you get a job, you make more money on top of your basic income guarantee. That's the simple idea. So is this a um, uh, is this a, a a universal payment that would presumably come from uh, the government? And we should say that uh, Switzerland, I believe it was well, maybe a year and a half ago now, or, or just over a year, um, uh, had a referendum to vote on the uh, on providing a basic or a I should say a universal basic income. Uh, I, I but my my recollection is that referendum failed. But is that, is that basically, uh, programmatically, how, how would it look? Oh, no, it hasn't, it hasn't failed. Um, it's very complex what's going on in Switzerland, is that uh, they had a successful petition initiative to, uh, to call for a referendum, and they, they gathered the petitions in September of 2013, so it's been nearly a year and a half, and so you think, wow, if I haven't heard anything about this referendum going through, then it must have failed sometime in the year and a half. But the way That's it works exactly in Switzerland for a national referendum is it, it takes three years uh, to go from getting the petition in to actually having the ballot. So uh, the next thing that happens is the government writes a report on it, and then uh, somehow the government is brought in to draft it. Whereas in the U.S., whenever there's a petition drive, it's always the, uh, it's, it's always the people who, who put forth the petition who actually then can write the thing just as it will appear on the ballot. But in Switzerland, the government ends up doing that. So we don't know exactly what the wording will be. So it's still probably over a year yet Okay. Um, until uh, they actually have this vote. So it'll be coming back in the news in the Switzerland so soon. There was another petition drive in the European Union as a whole. Thing. Uh, but that's, that raised almost 300,000 signatures, but they, they asked for a million signatures, which is very hard to get. All right, great. Well, so then, um, uh, so uh, getting back to the idea of, of how would it actually work? I mean, what does it mean? Does it mean essentially that the... That, um, a, a government would provide X number of dollars um, annually to to whom? 
Well, this depends on which model of basic income guarantee you're talking about. You asked about the different terms. The way uh, the U.S. big, the U.S. Basic Income Guarantee Network, had you has used the term since the turn of the century is uh, is that a basic income guarantee is is sort of a generic term for any sort of policy that's going to make sure income doesn't start at zero. You have some non, you have some uh, unconditional income that, that, that you can get. Now, there's two ways you can do that. There's two main ways you can do that. One is that you can give a check or a, ba a bank transfer to every single person, whether they work or not. Then you just tax what money they make privately so everyone will both receive a basic income and pay taxes. That's called the unconditional basic income, the universal basic income, or just basic income. Now, the other way to do it is usually called the negative income tax, which is to say, okay, we want income not to start at zero. We want everybody to have access to that, but we don't want to have everyone both receiving the basic income and paying taxes. So we're only going to give it to those whose income would uh, uh, would put them as a net recipient. So uh, so you have people that have no income get the full amount, the same as the basic income uh, as they would under unconditional income. But for every dollar they make privately, you take some of that back. So it sort of phases out as your income gets higher. That's the negative income tax. Both of them guarantee unconditionally that that every person will uh, will have an income uh, that's that's non-zero, hopefully enough to meet their basic needs. So, now, so, so wait, let me just just to clarify. <clears throat> so conceptually, when we talk about a negative income tax, we're basically talking about a means tested payment. Um, a a a negative income tax is means tested, but unconditional. And the means testing causes several problems, which is why, which is one of the reasons a lot of people say that the unconditional basic income model is better. It right. Is, I mean, the means it, testing it, it, is conditioned, right? It's conditioned upon your income. Yes. In okay. one sense, well, in one sense, it's unconditional that we're going to make sure that everybody has enough income to live on, whether they work or not. Okay. Um, so you get something even if you don't work. So everybody's got everybody in the whole country can get that. But the problems it causes is then if your income goes down, you have to apply for it. Right. Whereas if you have basic income, you're always getting that money. There's no chance of falling through the cracks if your income goes down. And another problem is you have then you have the problem of taking the family into account, the family size, and okay, what if. What if my spouse makes a lot of money, but I don't? And we're, if we're filing our taxes together, you wouldn't get a negative income tax. You would get a basic income. And this doesn't sound like such a big deal. Well, you're married to somebody who makes a lot of money, but, well, not every family is as sharing as we would like them to be. And you get some families where one spouse will take all the money and the, the other spouse and the children will end up being very poor. Hmm. All right, so so now why uh, you know I mean I think in in uh, in general I love the idea of this, um, but why not? I mean, what is problematic if, if if we're talking about now individual spouses? How will we deal with family units? Will we take into consideration like the children? Will ch children get it? Um, will uh, I mean? Well, uh, let me let me put it this way. Uh, beyond the principle that um, it is problematic for people to start at zero uh, in terms of, uh, of, of their income, I mean, what, what are the other benefits of it, or is that fundamentally it? And would this replace the welfare state? I mean, is that what it's supposed uh, to do? I mean, that's, you know, uh, th that's where it starts to get, I think, you know, in terms of implementation, a little problematic from my perspective, but uh, let me hear your take on that. Yeah, now you're getting into many of the differences even within the negative income tax and the unconditional basic income model. There's so many different ways people propose it. Uh, some say it should be just for adults. Some say it should be every man, woman, and child, regardless of anything. And uh, 
Some say it can replace uh, almost the whole welfare state. Others say, well, it can only replace certain parts of the welfare state. Um, now, the, uh, it can certainly replace something. If you got somebody who is in a country that has a generous unemployment insurance system where they're making, where they're making, uh, uh, or a single person is getting $25,000 a year in unemployment insurance, you don't want to give them a $25,000 basic income on top of that. So a single person has $50,000 a year. That's not going to be sustainable. It can replace some things, but how much it can replace is, is something that's open to issue and, and whether it should apply to children. My concern is that every single person on the world not have to live in poverty. So that somehow we get a policy where there's everyone knows every week they're getting an income comes in that's enough to keep them out of poverty. So that everybody has enough food to eat, decent shelter, clothes to wear, and the necessities of life. Now, how you do that is less important to me. It's more of a a strategic question. But once you're doing that, a lot of things that the welfare state is doing, you don't need. Other things right. you do need. You're still going to need wheelchairs for, for people who are disabled. You're going to need leader dogs for the blind. You might need to have more for old people uh, because they've worked all their lives. You're not gonna, it's not going to replace the, the entire pension system and so on. But you also have to take into account children. Now, there are two. If we paid every adult a basic income high enough that they could raise a child on it. You could see, you could conceivably eliminate all poverty with an adults only basic income guarantee. However, then you would end up giving adults without children something that's much higher than the poverty rate, which is probably not necessary. And uh, then on the other hand, if you give it to everyone with, with children, then uh, every time somebody has a child, you've got to increase the size of it. Um, some people have argued that you should have a smaller amount for children because once you've got your apartment or a couple has their apartment and their house and their bills and all that, a child costs less than a full adult. Probably the most realistic proposal is something that is, is something that is for, uh, that is that has a smaller amount for children and that it's built on top of it's built on top of social security so that people are so you're not going to get rid of something that's already been shown to work very well. I guess you know I mean as I dig into this I guess you know what my 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 response is part of this is you know people have been ta uh, you know asking me about this since I think you know the um, the 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 petition in to 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 create a referendum in Switzerland, and I've been digging into it. And one of the things that occurs to me, I mean, I you know, I'm definitely on board with the idea that um, the obviously that people should not be um, we should not have people living in poverty. And this seems to be a um, a, a a, a good uh, well, I mean, from uh, on on first principles, I I think that's um, in, in terms of outcomes, I that's an outcome that I uh, definitely appreciate. And the idea that you don't have to apply for it is the most attractive part about it that it's automatic. But as you start to uh, as we start to sort of parse out the the differences, for instance, okay, like you say, uh, if you're an older person, you're going to want uh, to have a pension system for that person as well. So that's in my mind, Social Security. You're also probably going to want for uh, older people or people who are sick or maybe everyone uh, some form of, of health insurance. So there we are in Medicare and Medicaid. In terms of payments to, to people with families, you know, one of the things that, you know, is, uh, uh, is very problematic from a policy standpoint, in my mind, it was the, the so-called welfare reform in 96, which made um, uh, uh, temporary assistance to needy families uh, basically uh, contingent upon work. It basically destroyed the, the TAMP in, in, in many respects. Um, so I guess m from my perspective, when we start to get down into the details, what it sounds like to me is simply shoring up those areas of our, uh, our safety net that we have attacked over the years. Why wouldn't, let's say, 
reversing welfare reform uh, from 96, increasing payments, uh, and simply being uh, more generous based upon uh, need, why wouldn't that be just as effective? Well, because even the more generous welfare system that the U.S. had in place in the 60s and 70s, more generous compared to what it is now, it wasn't working all that well. It was doing, it was doing a lot of good but it, for, for a lot of people, but it was, it was very wasteful and it was in many ways paternalistic and cruel. And um, it was still very conditional, is that you had to demonstrate need, and you had to demonstrate the, the, these different kinds of need. So if you're a single mother, that was one kind of need. If you're old, that's another kind of need. If you're disabled, that's another. If you're unemployed, that's another. And the administrative cost in keeping, in separating these people was a lot of, was a lot of money. And it gives then the system a way to be... Uh, paternalistic over them say, uh, well, are you really in need? Uh, let, me, uh, let me investigate you and investigate you, investigate you again to make sure that you're really in need. And you end up with a lot of wasted effort on the part of our uh, effort and funds on the part of our government and to, 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 uh, to policing people. And then a lot of wasted effort on the part of the recipients on satisfying the policing of people. And a consequence of that is a lot of people that then aren't helped when they really need help. And if you've got a uh, basic income, you, you got, you got a system that helps everybody that needs help. But, but haven't we just gone through like a, you know, as we talked about this, these, these, in fact, these conditions, like if you have children or not, or if you're older, or if you need a well ch a wheelchair, I mean that. I mean that's what seems to be problematic. Like it, the idea itself, I like, but when we start talking about putting it in practice, we end up putting these conditions. And you know, if you're going to have a wheelchair, you got to show me that you need a wheelchair. And then we need someone to sit there and be the person who decides whether or not someone needs a wheelchair or determine whether they do. I mean, I agree. Uh, that it, I, and I'm, I'm not so convinced either about the the administrative costs. I mean, we can we can talk about that, but I, you know, most of these programs, uh, as far as I know, relatively speaking, are actually not that expensive to administer. Uh, but 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 be that as it may, it seems to me that it's inevitable that we're going to end up with conditions, and that's you know I, that's what occurs to me is sort of like. Uh, problematic. And then from, uh, we're moving into like a strategic standpoint, then we're talking about, um, you know, are we expending political energy on uh, a, a program? And I like the idea from a philosophical standpoint, but are we expending uh, political energy on a program uh, that really in the end is just going to give us more or less, I'm not saying that we couldn't make vast improvements, on what we have, though structurally, uh, this is a good. This is a, this is a good question. Uh, these are good questions. Uh, you're asking things that uh, I don't typically get asked, so this is this is very good. Um, now, um, about the administrative cost, I did a paper with Michael Lewis more than ten years ago now, I think, where we looked at the issue of administrative costs, and we looked at a bunch of different programs, and you see an enormous range of, of how, what the overhead costs of, of for every dollar that they're spending on it, um, how much actually goes into, uh, actually goes into the pockets of the recipients. And I don't remember the exact figures, but there's a wide range of something like 10% for 10%. Uh, that means one, a dime for every dollar we spend was actually going to recipients for the worst of these programs. I think that was I think that was TANF, but I'm not sure, to over 90% for Social Security. The thing about Social Security, it, it is the simplest one. Right. It is to, uh, uh, you're this age, you put this in, you get that money, you buy that amount of money every year for the rest of your life with a, with a COLA adjustment or whatever. Very simple, very effective, low overhead costs. Now, what I want to do with basic income is to create a right of citizenship for the normal needs person person that has no so everybody 
has at least the needs of a normal person. So that, uh, so that all those needs, uh, the, that uh, your basic needs for food, shelter, and clothing are going to be covered by this basic income. That's a right of citizenship, is your share, the ownership in our country. You get that. You get that every month. No, con no conditions, no, no uh, categorizing, no means testing. Everybody gets that as a right of citizenship. Now, if you're going to say you need more than that, I need more than the typical needs person, or I deserve more than the typical needs person, then, then you have to show some kind of condition. Say, okay, I've worked for 50 years. Uh, I should get so, a pension because of this. Okay, well, then that'll be conditional. Or I'm very, I, I can't walk, I need a wheelchair, that will be conditional. But the main basic needs that we all shared will be covered without means test or work requirement. I have kids. That's a conditional, mm -hmm. right? Well, I well, mean, I mean well, a kid, well, um, it's not so much we're giving you a reward for having kids, but we're recognizing that the kids have needs. Or we're just paying, paying the kids. You're, you're taking it as a fiduciary for the children. Right. I mean, I, I think the idea is fascinating. And I, I mean, I, it's, uh, I, I, I like the principle behind it uh, because I think that um, it will, um, it, it, I mean, I like the principle behind it. Um, and I'm not sure if it, if it ends up achieving um, in practice, if it ends up achieving the gains necessarily that it's supposed to, but um, it's it's a fascinating idea, and I want I, uh, and and I want to leave it at that for the moment, and and turn to um, uh, some other work that you've done in terms of uh, a, a paper that um, I, I guess was cited. Uh, I cannot remember the context in which um, uh, it, it had been cited in someone else's work, and I ended up uh, 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 reading it. It was one that you had uh, written a while back entitled A Dilemma for Libertarianism. And um, let's talk about that because uh, it is, uh, I've spent a lot of time on this program over the years uh, debating libertarians, and I anticipate that we're going to hear more about uh, libertarianism uh, at least to a certain degree, with uh, Rand Paul today staffing up his campaign uh, to the extent that he's a legitimate libertarian. But why don't you tell us what is the, the, the primary dilemma for libertarianism as you've written it? Well, I, I should take this opportunity, since we're transitioning from basic income into libertarianism, I should take this opportunity to tell you the, the connection between my work on the two things. Which is, the, is that I'm actually a fallen libertarian. It was uh, uh, libertarians who, who interested me in basic income. When, the, uh, uh, when I was a kid, about 15 years old, Milton Friedman had a television show called Free to Choose, which I was very interested in, watched the whole thing, bought the accompanying book, read the stuff, and it had a chapter about what he was using the name the guaranteed income or the negative income tax as a solution to poverty, which I thought is that is a very good challenge to the left. If you really care about the poor, you should stop being paternalistic with them and just start giving them money. Now, uh, but so I, for a while, I actually thought I was a libertarian. And then for a while, I started using the term left libertarian, which I don't have a, anything against some people who use that term, but uh, I don't use it because I don't want to be associated with, uh, with libertarians. And because I found most libertarians, um, they talk a good game about freedom. But what most of their policies do, with the exception of those who support basic income, not even all of their, I mean, some of their policies are about freedom, drug legalizing or something like that. But most of their, pol most of their economic policies are not about freedom. They're about privilege. They're about entitlement. It's about it's about leaving the property owner free to do whatever they want with their property, but ignoring just the very fact that the government establishes their property and calls them a property owner without getting the consent of the people that thereby makes property less, is, uh, uh, is, is not defending freedom. It's defending a one-sided case of, of privilege at the expense of freedom. And so the dilemma paper that I wrote is, uh, 
is something that talks a, a, along those lines. Uh, now, your question was, what is this dilemma that I'm giving to libertarians? Am I right? Yes, and and I should say um, uh, I'm I'm happy that you're a fallen libertarian. That's why our phones seem to be working so well. Uh, we we seem to always have a problem uh, with our phones when we're talking to actual uh, um, uh, self-identified libertarians. But uh, but but I digress. But yes, I mean, tell us what that and and I think that you've touched on what uh, you've written is that dilemma of libertarianism is that. Uh, in in uh, espousing a a property right, it contradicts uh, their their notion of I guess of, of monopoly of power. Do I have that right? Well, it is actually um, although that I, that is that what the thing that I mentioned is is sort of a dilemma. That's not the thing that I define as a dilemma for libertarianism in that paper, which has to do with the the natural rights version of libertarianism, their argument of, from the appropriation of property. Say, why is it that they say that it's, it, it, it's uh, uh, an affront to freedom when you, the government taxes or regulates or redistributes private property? And they say, well, you have this story of the appropriation of property where the Lockean appropriator goes out by himself into the wilderness and appropriates property by mixing his labor with it, starting a farm and then selling that farm to other people. And then it, you could get uh, a capitalist economy by repeated applications, this appropriation and inheritance and resale. And that's what they say is happening. Now, and then they say, and then the government, if the government then comes along, and then when all of these rights are established, that it would be interfering with these uh, established human rights. What I do in the dilemma papers, I assume, okay, let's just assume that's a right, that you have a right to appropriate property and you have a right to buy, sell, and trade it, and the government and no one else, government or anyone else, has any right to redistribute that to maintain some notion of equality. Well, um, we could get a capitalist system out of that, but... How do we know we wouldn't get this scenario where someone says, okay, I, I, I'm just going to defend my own territory. I'm not going to join any protective organization to become a, a libertarian, to be part of any libertarian state. I'll just run my territory as, as, as if I was a king. And then I'll, I bring in some vassals and I, I get some uh, strategic marriage alliances with other with uh, other uh, landowners, and my estate gets larger and larger, and, and one day, one of my, uh, one of my uh, uh, subsequent uh, descendants is the Queen of England, and then uh, I own the entire, all of England, and I can tax and regulate England all that I want to, um, and I can give out people a quasi-ownership called title, but this is, of course, a subordinate title. Um, that it's a subordinate title to, uh, to my title as the ultimate authority, as the queen. And so the dilemma here is that repeated applications of this theoretical story of appropriation, inheritance, and transfer can justify monarchy just as well as they can justify a private property capitalism. So the dilemma for libertarianism is that if they stick with this, if they, they, the objection they could make is, uh, to this would be to say, well, that's too much inequality. But they've already said, oh, well, uh, we don't have any arguments against too much inequality, uh, to, uh, that, that there shouldn't be any arguments against too much inequality. It's just about repeated applications of, uh, of uh, appropriation, transfer, inheritance, and so forth. So they don't end up having any argument against the government owning the whole property. And then what I conclude is that we then uh, are, could be living in a world where there are 200 or so, we're actually in an anarcho-capitalism where we have 200 or so really big institutions that are just land-holding institutions which like to call themselves government but there's no reason to believe their ownership of property is any less legitimate than the ownership claims held by corporations and individuals. 
I mean, I think that's that's a, uh, a, a fascinating way to put it. I'm going to uh, definitely uh, question some libertarians in the future, hopefully, on that uh, dilemma. I mean, that's, I mean, fundamentally what it breaks down to, right, is that it's, it's really simply an argument for feudalism, um, uh, that when you simply say there should be no monopoly of force by the government, but it's okay to have monopoly of force by some other entity that is basically a government, but they just don't call themselves a government. Yes, exactly. And uh, what the typical response of a libertarian when I tell them this story, well, suppose the government is the successor of the original appropriator. Well, we said, well, that's not realistic. The government doesn't have rights that stem from original appropriation, which is exactly what just about everyone else says when they hear the libertarian story of this individual appropriator going out into the wilderness and starting his farm. That is not where private property rights come from either. Private property rights come from a long history of violence uh, where people have, have uh, established them by force, usually against people who were practicing more collectivist institutions before, if you go back far enough. So the unrealisticness of the story of of the queen having being the descent of of the property original property rights owner is just is no less or more unrealistic than the private property rights owner so they have no reason to distinguish what they want is a monopoly of violence by property owners but they have no argument then against a monopoly of violence by the government uh, it's uh, it's it's fascinating stuff and I I, I want to um, definitely open up uh, the uh, the forum. If there's any libertarians who would like to to call in and um, and 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 provide an answer for that dilemma, I am I'm certainly uh, hoping to hear it. Uh, Professor Carl Waterquist, uh, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, genuinely appreciate it. Uh, where can people go to get more information on a uh, gar guaranteed income? Uh, I would suggest go to basicincome.org. Uh, uh, binews.org, which is basic income news, a news website with daily news on basic income, or in the United States to uh, usbig.net, which is where uh, the U.S. Basic Income Guarantee posts its info. All right, great. We will uh, post that uh, usbig.net on our uh, front page at majority.fm. Thanks again uh, for your time today.